From the previous fluid mechanics lecture, we know that hydrostatic pressure increases linearly with depth. Since rho times g is what we define the specific weight, gamma, the expression can also be written as gamma times z. If you haven't seen that lecture yet, make sure to watch it first before watching this one. The link to that video is in the description below. Just like we have seen before, the force from the liquid on a submerged surface would be the pressure times the area of contact. But since the pressure changes with depth, the total force is actually the integral from the bottom to the top of the surface of the pressure times a d area. Now since the pressure is not changing in the horizontal axes and the submerged surfaces usually have a constant width, a reasonable 2D representation of this 3D problem is to assume the pressure on the wall as a triangular distributed load. The integral from the bottom to the top of the distributed load times dz would be the area under the curve or simply the area of the triangle just like it normally is for any of the triangular loads you've studied in courses like statics or mechanics of materials. Links below to those lectures and to the playlists for the entire courses. And just like with any triangular load, the location of the equivalent point load with that magnitude is the centroid of the triangle one third from the base. Calculating the area of this triangle is very simple. The base will be equal to the hydrostatic pressure, meaning that we know its value if we know the density of the liquid and depth information. And the height of the triangle is just the depth, or the distance from the base to the free surface. Notice however that the units of these areas would be force over length. To find the actual force value, we would have to multiply the area of the load times the width that we mentioned before, remember? The width that we got rid of to go from 3D to 2D. So always remember to multiply by the width value to obtain actual force values. Now the reason for calculating these hydrostatic pressure forces is to be able to calculate the reaction moment or forces that, for example, a gate has to generate to prevent the water from coming into an adjacent reservoir. So this topic is really closer to statics than fluid mechanics. Regardless, the process of finding the resulting horizontal load from the fluid pressure doesn't only work for vertical surfaces in contact with the liquid reservoir. If the surface in contact with the liquid is inclined, the horizontal forces affecting the surface will be calculated in the exact same manner. The magnitude of the equivalent point load in the horizontal direction would be equal to the area of the triangle of the triangular distributed load times the width meaning rho g h times h divided by 2 times the width, and it's also located one third of the way from the bottom to the top. Of course, on an inclined surface, the weight of the liquid, which is a vertical load, also affects the surface. The weight of the liquid would be the volume times the specific weight, which for a 2D representation is the area times the specific weight times width. The location of the simplified point load is located one-third of the way from the side of the triangle. Of course, we can add a bit of complexity to these hydrostatic pressure problems by, for example, having a curved surface at the bottom of the reservoir, or having only sections of the floor be slanted, or also having submerged gates where you're only interested in the hydrostatic forces of portions of walls that do not begin at the free surface. So if you're interested in any of these, I strongly suggest that you click on the first link in the description of this video that reads hydrostatic pressure in 8 minutes, and watch all 4 problem examples right below it, as this has been covered in much more detail for the statics course. What we'll use this hydrostatic pressure concept for, at this point, is to understand buoyancy, and the mathematical expression we'll use for calculating it. For a submerged object of any shape, we can see that the pressure at any point on the surface of that object will be given by the depth z from the surface of the fluid to the specific location on the object. If we think of this object as a collection of infinitesimal columns of material, we can write the forces due to the pressure that affect any of them. The volume of the column would be the infinitesimal horizontal cross-section area dA times the height of that specific column. Now if we do a sum of forces in the z direction for any of the columns, but only the forces that result from the pressure differences, meaning without the weight of the material inside the column, we would get the pressure at the top, which is rho g z1 times dA going down, and the pressure at the bottom, which is rho g z2 times dA going up. And by the way, we only want the forces due to the pressure, because that's what we're gonna call buoyancy forces. Those are completely separate from the weight of our object. 
Rearranging this expression, we see that the magnitude of the force is equal to rho g times delta z times dA. And since the volume of that little column is exactly that, a dA times delta z, we can write this term as a delta volume dV. The last thing to do here is to find the overall total force, not just the infinitesimal force dF that affects each column. For that, we integrate both sides and regardless of what the z value is for the top and bottom of each column, we will always see that the delta z is the height of each column and therefore f is equal to rho gv. We usually use either f sub b or just capital B to refer to the buoyancy force. And of course, this buoyancy force is always going up. The pressure at the bottom surface is always higher than on the top surface, creating a net force going upward. And also, note that the density rho is that of the fluid and has nothing to do with the density of the floating or submerged object. Let's see how we use the buoyancy force with a simple example. And if you'd like to watch more complex examples regarding buoyancy and hydrostatic pressure, make sure to check out the links down in the description below. There, you'll find the links to other lectures of the fluid mechanics course as well as other engineering courses like SOLIDWORKS, Mechanics of Materials, or Machine Design. Let's say we have a cork floating on the surface of water in a glass. We somehow determine that 72% of the volume of the cork is above the water surface. We would like to find out what the density of the cork is. To do this, we'll use buoyancy. And notice that we don't have the total volume or the mass of the cork, or even the shape. Usually, the shape is only helpful to be able to determine dimensions outside the water and to therefore be able to calculate a percentage of the volume that is floating outside the water. But that's a whole other problem, link below if you're interested. If we draw a free body diagram of the floating cork, we would see its weight going down and a buoyancy force going up. The mass would be equal to the density of the cork times whatever its volume is. The weight would be that mass times g. The buoyancy is equal to the density of water, since this is what the cork is floating over and displacing, times g times the submerged volume, which in this case is the remaining 28% of the cork's volume. Since the cork is not accelerating up or down, the sum of forces is zero. Assuming a simple density of water of 1000 kilograms per cubic meter in metric, we can solve for the density of the cork to be 280 kilograms per cubic meter. We could also keep the gravity term and use the specific weight of 62.4 pounds per cubic foot for water to find the specific weight of the cork to be 17.7 pounds per cubic foot. Remember that there's a difference between pound force, pound mass, and slugs. Very annoying. If you want to check a video explaining that difference or other examples or lectures of the fluid mechanics course, make sure to check out the links in the description below. Thanks for watching.